Okay, so we, we are talking about building a better tomorrow of all the social media uh, is they look like they're having such a nice life over there. Okay, and I'm sure you've seen those pictures where the before and the after, the, what the photo looks like versus how much effort it took to make that photo, and that that happy family in the photo actually fought before and after. <laughs> That's because the kids weren't sitting right in the photo, this one didn't smile, that one didn't do this, must we do it again? So it's a complex world. And in this complex world, the question remains, and what we're trying to figure out is how do we build a better tomorrow for us as a congregation? What are some things that we can put into place that... We're not saying, thus says the Lord, certainly guided by Scripture, uh, but it's not, it's a, mu uh, it's a must for always, uh, but maybe a much more very helpful for now, okay? In other words, what we are learning today or speaking about over the last couple of weeks might change in two, three, five, ten years because we need to keep on navigating as to what is helpful to us, what might, even what we speak about might look different five years from now as we navigate a new world. So we have obviously said that Jesus Christ and what we're building is the foundation of everything. The fact that we have divine DNA, which is an intense idea in itself. I don't know if you've thought about that. I know you get the accused personalities and the, uh, what is the other one that's accused then? Deceived. Oh, yeah, the deceiver, of course I've got divine. <laughs> what do you mean? I am divine. <laughs> okay, we, we, we get that too. But it's a quite overwhelming thought to think that we've got divine DNA, that somehow the DNA of the divine is in me, and therefore I have capacity to love, capacity to be merciful, capacity to be forgiving. And in essence, what Jesus was is showing us when... Your humanity is not in the way of your divinity, what it looks like. In other words, when your humanity stops fighting your divinity, you get Jesus. Okay, freaky thought. Think about it some more. Then obviously we have Scripture. Uh, we build on Scripture to guide us to be this community. We have the Holy Spirit that nudges us. And again, I've seen the Holy Spirit do uh, fascinating things in the hearts of people. I still get often people coming to me, thanking me for how a message helped them in a way that I definitely did not say in the message. It's like, it's after the service, so then I knew it was definitely me. They're not referring, <laughs> referring to someone else. But they're speaking about something that I didn't. Okay, but yet God somehow worked that to, to move them. Uh, then we, we obviously mentioned, and this, this is, I think this is the thing that we hate most. And we want to deny at all possible cost. Okay, I can see people are looking away, they're looking at the roof, they're looking at their feet, they're scurrying in their Bible. Uh, but this is hard. But it's real. Personal responsibility. Train yourself to be godly. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Then, obviously, as a young Christian, that uh, I would have a training partner. As someone, as Jesus trained the twelve. As a Paul trained, a Timothy, a Titus, uh, an older, more mature Christian training a younger Christian and the ways of God and the ways of the kingdom, uh, absolutely essential, uh, as I've shared before, my life uh, irreversibly uh, impacted by one year of training. My first trainer was in my life for one year, okay, and shaped my life irreversibly. But then from there, we need to graduate uh, if we want to build this, to, uh, oh, that, there it goes again, sorry about that, to faithful friends, okay, we need to be able to make a jump to say, my, from training partner, from someone being ahead of me spiritually, actually to us doing more of a this, okay, where uh, we become faithful friends, we looked at, okay, so what is a faithful friend, a friend uh, that is both faithful to God, a friend, now yes, uh, this, this has been interesting in getting feedback after last Sunday how people are processing this. Because uh, one is, I've had people come back to me and say, uh, someone even said, listen here, I've asked for a show of hands, who, actually, who feels that they have an actual friend in the church, never mind a faithful one. Okay, in other words, where's a friend that you actually enjoy spending time with. 
someone that you have a love and uh, you have a love for and a sincere interest in and trust and, and, and vice versa before we even come to faithfulness. And so realize there are certainly some uh, cracks and armor for us and just in friendships, but then obviously both faithful uh, to God and faithful to you. So now it's, it's a friend faithful to God. They want to live out God's divine purposes for their life, and they are faithful to you uh, because they care deeply about you, and they want that in your life too. Now, what has been interesting in conversation, and I appreciate people coming up to me saying, listen, you know, I have been a Christian for two, three decades, and I realized that after three decades, I only have one faithful friend, two faithful friends. I should be having ten. Or I have no faithful friends. I have acquaintances, I have friends, I have a discipling partner, but a faithful friend, a mutual relationship. And as I said last week, I want to say again, this is something that we have to get right. This is something that we have to talk about. This is something that we have to take responsibility for. If you don't have a faithful friend, you know, ask yourself, okay, so I don't have a faithful friend, so what am I going to do about it? Who do I need to have a conversation with? Or I've heard people say, oh, you're definitely my faithful friend. And then you can see the other person all, sort of awkwardly like, <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. That's definitely, no, there's something, something missing there. Both parties need to agree. And, and I think we need to have those honest conversations. Because it sort of feels a little bit awkward if someone comes to you and says, you're my faithful friend in your heart. You think, No. But now you need to pretend. Sure. I think we say, wow, man, thank you. What makes you feel that way? And, and wow, here's, here's sort of how I'm feeling. And why? But how, how do we get to be that garden-like community if we cannot have a faithful, loving conversations with friends where we call each other friends? So I think this is of uh, the highest importance, that we move from person A uh, training and, for lack of a better word, well, it is what it is, being over person B. In other words, I'm higher than you. Even unconsciously, I'm a trainer. We have to be able to move to our relationships where it's mutual. One another. One another. We help one another. And that the help that we give one another should be greater than the help that you get from the pulpit. Okay? That is where growth, we can plant thoughts and ideas for you to think about, to comp contemplate. But even those ideas are going to go nowhere if you don't have a faithful friend that you can talk with it through and say, how do we how does this become a reality for us uh, in our world? So faithful friends, it's key. Up next, mentor, okay? We need mentors. So here, you could say, and a training partner, to some degree, your training partner as a young Christian was most probably a faithful friend and a mentor in one. But then as you mature, and everyone matures, that actually splits off and most likely into two different people. I would say, yeah, I don't want to put this highly likely. <laughs> well, rephrase, not two different people, to two different groups of people. Groups of people. In other words, uh, I should have put an S on there, faithful friends and mentors. So, question for you guys. No right or wrong answer, just to pick your brain, talk to your neighbor, not your spouse, what is the difference between a mentor and a training partner? What would you say? What do you think is the difference between someone being my training partner and someone being my mentor? Okay, see, Elena is struggling there with uh, speaking to Jesus next to her because Kai's on the other side. Uh, you can talk to Kai then. It's okay. <laughs> okay, so have a conversation. Let's, two minutes. Let's try and figure, talk about that. Okay, have we solved the problems of the world? <laughs> now, 
again, what I want to encourage us to do is obviously, an, why is that the rain? In ancient, in ancient times, they, well, they still have today, but let's talk about in the times of Jesus, they had Jewish synagogues. And the synagogue was not a place of preaching, it was a place of discussion. And so the rabbi would come up, and the rabbi would share ideas, and then the people in the synagogue would discuss the ideas. They would debate the ideas. And that's what I certainly want to encourage us to do as a congregation. I know we don't give you enough time to talk through it, to take the conversation home, okay, and continue to discuss these ideas. And again, what I'm saying today is I'm going to share some perspectives here, and that whatever I share doesn't mean what I say is the way. I'm saying here, here's a perspective, here are possibilities, planting seeds, let's work with these possibilities, uh, and let's start a place where the we can work from. So in the Bible, uh, you definitely see mentoring relationships, and they uh, are different in nature. They are not prescriptive, uh, as in it doesn't say that uh, Jethro uh, mentored Moses and you must be mentored in the same way. It doesn't even say that he mentored them. You can just make the observation that he mentored them. Uh, in Exodus 18, you can read it by yourself. Uh, we're not going to go through the whole thing. But Moses is, is responsible for the people of Israel. Uh, he's not meeting their needs. Uh, he has great fatigue. They have great fatigue. His father-in-law, Jethro, sees what's going on. Uh, he intervenes. And he helps them see that the way that that Moses is managing the people of God, because it's a huge family, <laughs> okay, it's not helpful. Okay, there are possible problems, and then he offers a solution. Uh, and he shares this from wisdom of experience. And he provides the possibility for Moses, not commands, provides the possibility for Moses of a new leadership structure. He teaches them the importance of delegation if you're responsible for such a big group of people. He encourages him to, as you read the text, to look for qualified leaders of smaller groups that would be able to meet the needs uh, of the people. And then he, see, he helps them see these are some possible benefits that you will gather. I mean, one conversation, think about it, one conversation that he suggests that Moses took that counsel, did it, and it changed the whole way that the nation operated. One conversation where you had an experienced mentor and you had a willing mentee who said, thanks, <laughs> that could work. Okay, we see a bit of a different setup between uh, Naomi and Ruth. And you can go and read that short book, Book of Ruth, uh, obviously, uh, Ruth's husband, Naomi's son, dies. And again, you see Naomi taking, if you may, uh, Ruth under her wing and taking care of her, giving her emotional support through this journey, uh, helping her as Ruth says this, and your, your people are my people, I'm going to join you, and they move to Israelite territory. How to navigate life in Israelite territory introduces uh, Ruth to her God, okay? H helps her see how does the customs work here? Uh, things like when uh, in the harvest, uh, the Israelites were commanded to leave a portion of the harvest for the poor, that they can not, not uh, uh, harvest the outskirts of the field. And she's helping Ruth with, this is how it works here. You can actually go and you can go and get for us, you can get some of that grain for us. Uh, also, they needed, in a patriarchal world, they needed a man to take care of them. Boaz was the, what's called the kingsman redeemer. I'm not going to go into all the complexity of that. But she, uh, Naomi is the one mentoring Ruth how to navigate this, how to reach out to this uh, distant relative that can take uh, responsibility for her. Uh, she teaches her customs like a strange custom that you need to, in his tent, go and lie by his feet. Now listen, if I wake up with anyone at my feet, <laughs> I ain't going to be your kingsman redeemer. <laughs> okay, strange custom. But it was the custom. Who guided her in it? Someone more uh, experienced than her, older, advanced in years, and experienced in the customs. Uh, then uh, we see the same with Mordecai and Esther. Uh, now, Esther, if you look at it, and uh, I mean, they could possibly even be sisters. I don't know if you picked up on that. But anyway, <clears throat> uh, obviously, Mordecai and Esther is the same deal where uh, she uh, becomes part of 
uh, the new king's wives, set of, <laughs> set of wives concept in itself. Uh, he obviously helps you navigate that. And first, okay, keep your identity as a Jew a secret because this is going to be a problem. Okay, but then again, there's problems for the Jews, and then help her navigate that. How can you actually, in the place that God has placed you, put you, how can you utilize that actually for the salvation of our people? Okay, then challenges come along the way, and she's constantly interacting with Mordecai, and he's giving her counsel as to possibility. But with each of the people, uh, Moses, uh, Ruth, uh, Esther, the responsibility and decision lies with them. These mentors are there to give them counsel and guidance of years of wisdom or experience, but they need to decide what they'll do with it. So if we look at the, uh, my take on the difference between a training partner, because what I'm suggesting is that every young Christian, every young married couple, every young parent, every young leader, every young minister, every young anything needs training. Okay, needs a training partner in that new young phase and most likely needs it for around about two years. When it goes beyond that, you need to ask why. Okay, did I not do a good job? Are they not a learner? Does it make a difference? What have you. Again, I know there's nuances to these things. But on role and approach, let's take a trainer. A trainer is someone who has hands-on training. That's Jesus with the 12. It's hands-on. He's with them every step of the way. He's modeling the behavior. He is interacting with the people. He's touching the leper. He is doing it. And what he is saying to these guys is, now do likewise. Do as I do. I do, you do. Now, I do, you observe. Now, you do, I observe, I see you, and I see how you guys are interacting. It's real-time feedback. Okay? And that, as I said, for me as a young everything has been priceless. And I've had that as a young Christian, as a young minister, as a young parent. I've had older, more mature parents, training partners, give me real-time feedback, even in how to discipline my two-year-old. Where, uh, and, and I tell you, I don't know if you, about you, but sometimes I walk in the mall, and I want to be a training partner to many parents. <laughs> I want to give real-time feedback. Okay, when, when the kid is whining and complaining and they're throwing sweets at him to calm him down uh, and doing everything, I'm like, listen, I, I just I want to give real-time feedback and say, listen, your plan is not working. It's not working for you. It's not working for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, as, oh man, I had a year or two, or five years ago, whenever it was, there was, I saw this play out, out my office has got glass doors there at Surge, and this played out right there. Oh, man, I, I bit my tongue. I bit my tongue. I bit my tongue. I bit my tongue. And eventually, I stepped out the door. <laughs> and I just said, hello. <laughs> and started chatting, and I said, hey, have you ever considered? <laughs> okay. And, and then off they went without, <laughs> without my consideration. But real-time feedback. <laughs> Many of us have thought it. I'm the only one that has actually done it. But you've thought it. Don't, don't. <laughs> Don't pretend like you haven't. Training partner is an active participant in the real-time deal. It's intensive training. So I said, I would suggest year or two. Mentor has a very different approach. A mentor provides guidance, wisdom, advice based on experience rather than direct involvement. So in other words, you meet with the mentor. The mentor doesn't go with you. The mentor is not walking with you. You meet with the mentor. You put things before him. Hey, here's some challenges that I'm facing and leading Israel, Moses. What would, what would be some things that I need to consider as I navigate this? Okay. But it's not direct involvement. <clears throat> uh, let's talk about duration and commitment. Training partner. It's longer term. It's not a, it's not a once-off chat <laughs> or a once-a-month chat. It's more intensive. It's frequent interactions. Again, it's the, it's the working with. It's brilliant. Um, a mentor can be short or long term. In other words, you are blessed if you have someone that is way ahead of you spiritually and can mentor you for a long period of time and they're willing to do it. It can be short. It can be one conversation. I tend to, when I go to conferences uh, in the ICC, I try to set up time with people ahead of time uh, that I know I will only get this one chat with them. One chat, that's it. 
but I fight for that chat. <laughs> and I say, hey, can, can we grab a coffee? Can I buy you lunch? Can I buy you breakfast? Can I do anything? Uh, just, I just want to ask some counsel. Uh, one, one shot. I know I have that one shot, and I try to, try to grab it. Less frequent, um, more uh, structured. In other words, uh, it's actually a time where the dude says to me, okay, hey, sure, great, let's, let's have coffee. We've got an hour. He's not saying, hey, a difference. Learning and development, training partner. Uh, you're teaching practical skills, uh, immediate application. Hey, listen, you, this is, this is uh, and I appreciate yesterday, uh, so much was shared about Linda Mayer's prayer life and how people would pray with her. So, hey, let's pray together. Let's do this, okay, practically. Uh, how to study the Bible. Okay, let's take a text. Let's do it together. Uh, as I shared a couple of weeks ago, myself going door knocking, learning, hey, let's do it, let's do it together, practically, immediately. Uh, a mentor is offering insight from a broader perspective. They're not going to, again, do it together with you. Consider. Here are things to think about. Here is broader than what it is that you are necessarily even directly asking. They widen your mind. So I'll give you an example. I have uh, someone that has been a mentor for me, uh, and the mentors that I have, I'll share as we go, are very sporadic and all over the place, uh, meaning uh, the world, uh, Paul Ramsey. And so through the years, I have Paul Ramsey uh, lives in Austin, Texas, I think. He's lived in Columbia. Like I said, I don't even know where he lives. Uh, but we'll get on Zoom or talk. And uh, at that time, uh, was with regards to the issue of dating. Not for me, for my girls. <laughs> okay? And knowing how to uh, navigate, and I can already see the, the looks on the faces here, but na navigating how to, how do you navigate that subject matter? Okay? And then fears that I had in that subject matter. But, but I didn't even know that I had fears. So I asked him, hey, how did you think about it as a parent? You've got grown uh, adult kids, or married. Uh, how did you think about it? Uh, and I, I said, because I'm not feeling good about it. <laughs> okay, as in, they're very young. And then he said to me, he brought a perspective, he said, what are your concerns? I can give plenty of concerns, <laughs> okay? But you're my main concerns. Then he said, okay, is there a way for you to mitigate those concerns? So in other words, uh, enmeshment for me is one of the concerns. Is there a way to mitigate enmeshment? Because an enmeshed 14-year-old is never good. It goes bad. Is there a way, well, that was 16 basically back then, but is there a way to mitigate that? Again, broader perspective. Versus the two-year-old, hey, dude, I saw you do that. Uh, it's not going to work. Emotional support training partner throughout, uh, throughout the training period, they give you emotional support. They become a friend. Uh, the mentor uh, is through encouragement and understanding uh, of what's happening, not necessarily involvement. So in other words, the training partner walks with you, supporting you, encouraging you. The mentor is encouraging in the moment, but you might never see them again. But they were very understanding in the moment. There's a, there's a good reason why these two are very different, because this one takes an enormous amount of time. And if you try to transplant it into that one, you're not going to find someone to mentor you. <laughs> okay? Because they cannot be everyone's best friend. Accountability. I'm having trouble with the connection. Please try again in a moment. Okay, I think it's where this is Siri. Okay, accountability, training partner, regular check-in and accountability. Uh, mentor, not so much so. The mentee is responsible for the accountability. What they can do uh, is give guidance. So in other words, listen here, you can ask uh, the mentor, listen, I need accountability. Uh, I know you're not going to give me accountability. Help me think about accountability. Can you see the difference? One is young. One is how you work with a five-year-old. The other one is how you start working with a growing teenager and an adult. The way you treat your kids, they're different. The two, three, four, five-year-old, you, it's, listen, we need you to do ABC. 
You don't touch the plug. You don't steal. You don't whack your brother. You, there's not necessarily always a whole lot of explanation going around it. This is real-time feedback. <laughs> okay? You do A, B happens. Okay? But you don't do that with a teenager, and you definitely don't do it with an adult. So it's a maturing process that takes place. Learning style of these two are different. This is active experiential learning. I'm learning with you by watching. Okay? Uh, doing, reflecting. Uh, I do with you, and we reflect together. We go on, I remember this, going on dates together with my training partner, okay? And he giving me real feedback, real time feedback afterwards and we reflect. How do you feel like the date went? I said, I think it was super. I said, okay, good for you. <laughs> you were the only one who thought that. <laughs> okay, I don't think the sister thought that. I don't think she felt looked out for, looked after, and, and the, these are small adjustments that you could make that could possibly make her feel more loved and encouraged as a sister. A mentoring learned through listening, observing, applying, and possibly giving feedback. So now it's I'm listening, I'm learning, I'm applying, and possibly I give feedback to the mentor if I meet them again. So, again, a difference between the two. Reality is we all need, at some point in our lives, whenever we're young at anything, we need a training partner. But then we must graduate to the next level. We must graduate to be able to have faithful friends and mentors in the multiple. I cannot just have one faithful friend. I need to have multiple faithful friends. I cannot just have one mentor. I need to have multiple mentors. Because not one mentor, not one individual can have it all together. But I can have a mentor that can help me in this area, and a mentor that can help me in that area, and a mentor that can help me in this area. But let me tell you this, what the mentor can't do is your parenting. What I mean by that is, if I, went, if I wasn't parented properly, <laughs> then that mentor is going to have a very tough job that they cannot do. And we experience this in the workplace, adult world, were you working with adults who weren't parented properly? I heard someone say the other day, not, not part of the church, that said, I said, hey, how's your kid, a teenager, this, that? And I said, sure, not tough, but parenting. And I said, and, and your wife, how are you? I said, sure, I feel like I need a parent her too. Because I need a parent her on how to parent my kid because she is almost worse than the kid. Okay, and didn't mean it in a mean spirit. What the person said was an actual fact true. Because there was areas, there were gaps in his wife's personal parenting as a child that now came out in a parenting as an adult that he now had to try and mitigate. We need training. We need proper parenting. And when we have been properly parented, <laughs> a mentor goes the distance as an advisor and helping us move ahead. So here's the idea, guys. While we are working the field, you are a young Christian, you're a young parent, you're a young leader, whatever. We are working with one another. What should we be doing? As I am working the field as a young Christian, as a young leader, I should be identifying in the field with me other faithful friends. I should be saying as I'm being trained in the area as a young leader, oh, here's a, another young leader that can also be my faithful friend. And as we walk with one another, talk with one another, I can see, but listen, that guy over there, I look at them, and I know they are ahead of me in years or life phase or whatever. They're not going to necessarily be a faithful friend, but they can possibly be a mentor. And so as you're working, guess what you're looking for? You're looking for faithful friends and for mentors. Whose responsibility? All responsibility is Greg's. <laughs> Whose responsibility? It's my responsibility. My faithful friends are my responsibility. My mentor is my responsibility. If I don't have mentors, I'm responsible for finding them. But I can't find them. I went through a time where I felt like, sure, this is years ago, James went through with me through it, and Jock, Hannes back in the day, where I felt like we were trying to navigate as a young staff leadership dynamics that we couldn't necessarily find around us. 
And so we couldn't find the mentoring as we searched than what we needed. So we turned to books. And saying, who has written a book <laughs> that has what we want? We started doing that. We started looking outside of the local congregation and outside of the ICOC for that matter. Who has what we want that we can learn from that can be a mentor, one of the mentors of what it is that we are trying to do? Why have a mentor? Youngsters that by this time is falling asleep in the service because it's been too long. Why do you need a mentor? For a lack of guidance, a nation falls, but victory is won through many advisors. I thank God for the advice that Paul Ramsey gave me years ago because it made an enormous difference in how I navigated that situation. The way of a fool seems right to him, but the wise man listens to advice. How many times have I been saved from making stupid decisions by simply asking counsel? How many times did I run into a stupid decision because I did not seek counsel? Many advisors makes victory sure. Plans fail for a lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. We all, I think God has wired us for this. We need input in our lives. What to look for in a mentor? Some basics. You're looking for a mentor, someone that's more experienced than you. And prayerfully, not someone that started the job yesterday that you started today. <laughs> okay? A little bit further down the line than that. Someone who is more spiritually mature than you. Someone who is more discerning than you. And someone who exemplify the qualities and spiritual things that you aspire to in your journey. So I'm looking for a mentor. And, and we, we can go through it and say, okay, I want to have a vibrant relationship with God. What should I look for? Someone who's more experienced than me. Someone who has the vibrant relationship with God that I'm looking for. Someone who is spiritually more mature, who has a whole different level of relationship with God than what I want. Um, I'm looking for a better understanding of Scripture. Let me reverse back to this one. I'll take both. Okay, so I feel like over the last couple of years, I've gone through what uh, John of the Cross, an ancient, well, not that ancient, 1600s, I think, or something, uh, a writer, wrote A Dark Night of the Soul. Let me ask this. Who of us, let's see if I'm alone, who of us feel like in our relationship with God, spiritually, life, that we are maybe going through, now this is going to take some vulnerability, so we'll give a second of silence here for you to think. But if we're honest, who of us feels like we're going through a bit of a dark night of the soul? Okay, there's a couple of us. Uh, my dark night has been more than a night. <laughs> okay, it's been a while, it's been years. Who's helping you navigate it? Now, for, for me, um, Dave Pachter, some of you might or might not know him, has been a mentor for me for about eight years. We talk maybe once a quarter uh, through things I initiated. Uh, and he's, he's gone through a dark night of the soul uh, for many years himself. And he has come out on the other side, definitely what I want to be. Uh, I just listened to him talk uh, and share his experiences, his vulnerability, where he's now, how his perception of God has changed over the years and through the journey that God has taken him. And I think, sure, I want that. And help me get there. This is where I am. This is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm feeling. Uh, he, he provides ideas. He gives me things to read. He says, read this book, read that book. I read it. I come back. I initiate time again. And we talk through it. He's helping me go through it. A better understanding of Scripture. I've wrestled through some issues in the Scriptures over the last couple of years. And uh, another mentor for me, and to him I speak maybe once a year, uh, is Douglas Jacoby. Again, I don't know where he's in the world. He travels a lot. Uh, we're definitely not besties. Um, but I, I call him up. Sometimes I just leave a voice note. And uh, we've been together in Israel. I've seen Douglas on many occasions and places. And now he's got a world full of people. Uh, but yet he has the grace and kindness to once a year. We get to talk through these things. I say, help me resolve these things. Help me to think through these things. Okay. Again, someone more experienced, more spiritually mature than me, more discerning than me. I want a more fulfilling life. Get a mentor. Uh, I want to learn and make more decisions. I look in the rearview mirror and the decisions look a bit flaky. Get a mentor. 
uh, how to improve my impact in the workplace. I feel like I'm living these two lives, okay, completely separate from each other. Get a mentor, a teenager, this one. You guys need help, I think, totally. And I don't mean it in a mean way at all. I mean it's a reality that, that us as parents cannot grasp. As a teenager, how do I navigate and integrate my three personalities? <laughs> Who wants to take a guess? Teenagers, who are your, what are your three personalities? Yeah, say. Be out there. My own daughter, yes? Say, say, to, say to Daniel and then he'll tell me. He's saying no. Caleb? Depression. Depression. <laughs> yes, and what else? Anxiety. Anxiety. And sadness. And sadness. Okay, those are Those are deep, vulnerable feelings. Okay? And those get... What, you know what creates those? It's the three personalities. Our kids need to have three personalities. One at home, one at school, one at church. Okay? And that's why I think they experience many of those things. We that are older don't necessarily, maybe two, maybe it's one. Or maybe it's work, home and work. But for them, it's really it's three. Who am I at home in my safe space? Who am I at school and what do my friends expect from me? And who am I at church and what does the church expect from me? And how do the older people look at me and what do they expect of me? It's three different personalities. How do I integrate that? That's a tough job. You need a mentor. Can you talk to your parents about that? Most likely not. Some can, most can't. They won't understand me. But you need mentors. Okay, we all need mentors. How to play better with others. I've heard people say, oh, well, people just don't seem to like me. Do you... <laughs> well, one is, it could be true. <laughs> well, I don't fit in. Why? Get a mentor. People don't seem to gravitate to me. Why? Get a mentor. Get someone to help you figure it out. Okay? We have people that can help us. How to set and navigate boundaries. This is a big thing in church. Who of us feels like in church our boundaries sometimes get crossed? <laughs> get a mentor. Someone that can help you navigate. This is a boundary. This is, this is, a, this is a boundary. This is not a small one. But years ago, there was a, a, a brother, man. He, he, I like my personal space. Oh, man, this dude, he did not like personal space. So he would, if, if, this is, if we, we talk, I'm here, he's here. And then I go like this. And, he, and I go like this. And he takes a step forward. And he takes a step. small thing. But he says, and he says to me, I like to be up close. I like to be up close when I, <laughs> when I talk to people. Oh, dude, I don't like to be up close when I talk to people. Back away, back away. That, that's not a minor thing. But we have it where people just jump on our boundaries. I want, either we don't have a boundary, and that's why we jumped on or we put the boundary. We don't know how to navigate it. Mentor, mentor, mentor. How to be a more loving husband, a more respectful wife. Sermon series on its own. Mentor. How to be engaged in a loving parent. Mentor, mentor, mentor. Mentor, mentor, mentor. <clears throat> I need mentors. I can tell you any good, and there's a lot of stuff in my life that's out of place. Any good that has happened in my life has been because of mentors. Any good decision that I've made has been because of mentors. Those wiser, more mature, spiritual guides that has helped me. In closing, what do I look for in a mentee? Okay, who of us feels like I need a mentor? Okay, my guess is most of us. <clears throat> now, I, I was going to skip this, but I thought I need to put it in. If I am to mentor someone, that's just me, and I've got a feeling other people will feel similar. What am I looking for in a, a mentee? Meaning I can only mentor a very small amount of people, so wh who do I mentor? Who do I have the capacity to mentor? What do I look for in a mentee? Humility. They must actually want to learn. <laughs> Sounds silly. But is it? 
appreciation. I appreciate, if, if Douglas Jacoby can give me 10 minutes, I take it. I don't tell him, why don't you have an hour? Okay, I'm your brother. <laughs> okay, if, if Dave Parker says to me, whatever works on his, we are seven hours and time difference, whatever time he picks, he always, he, he's very kind, he always asks me, okay, what time will work for you? I say, pick whatever day at a time, I work around you. Okay, uh, I know that I can move other stuff around in my life. Uh, I know that for me, I feel like I'm in a privileged position here. Okay, he's willing to give me time a day, uh, share the wisdom that he has, how lucky I, I, am I. Ownership and responsibility. I'm looking for someone when I, if I'm in a mentoring thing, do they actually listen? I have countless and countless and countless and countless of times, and very recently as well. Uh, be, be in, <laughs> and I see some of the parties know, <laughs> and, and know what I'm referring to, but the idea of someone comes to me, I give them, that, uh, they put a matter before me, and they say, hey, uh, what do you think about this matter? And then I say, listen, uh, obviously what experience is, is you've seen a movie multiple times over. That's what experience comes from. In other words, you've seen, if someone takes this path, nine out of ten times this is where it lands. And the longer you're around and the more you engage with that, the more you see the same thing. You see nine out of ten times this is what happens. And so, so in my experience, I would suggest path A. No, they want to take path B. Okay, great, take path B. Now they come back. Oh no, we're still in the same position. Okay, well, what I would suggest is consider path A. Oh, okay. What are they going to do? Path B. They come back, I kid you not. <clears throat> this has happened many times in my lives. And I'm sure I've done it as well and just wasn't even aware of it. And I said, that, same situation. Okay, path A. What do they do? Path B. Later on where I landed, so I would say to people, when they come to me with the same thing, as I say, you, no, thank you. You know what I'm going to tell you. You keep on asking me the same question. I keep on telling you the same thing. You keep on doing the opposite of the same thing. You keep on getting the same result. I do not understand why we're having this conversation. Okay? So there needs to be a responsibility and ownership of this. Is, this is to, if it's to be, it's, if, if I say if, if it's to be a God and everything is in it, but it's my responsibility it's my responsibility. So we want to build on these things, guys. We want to build the garden. I think we, we will not be sitting here in the rain if we didn't, but we need help. Even though God has given us all these things, as we said, all these things is ultimately His abundant, abundance of grace that is poured out onto us, the divine DNA, the Scripture, the Holy Spirit, a training partner. If we want to build this, we have to identify and say, this is God's grace. A faithful friend is God's grace. A mentor is God's grace. And we need it all to build together. Again, I say to you, I sit here and I see people that have been around for 20, 30 years. You're here for a reason. Okay? You can be sitting at home. You can be in your nice warm little bed. You can be watching Netflix. You can be going out for breakfast. You're here and you're here for a reason. You want to do something better. Don't do it alone. You cannot do it alone. We were not made to do it alone. Let's build a better tomorrow together. God bless. Amen.